watch too much hockey. Puck face from Monday to Saturday and Sunday matinees. Puck face. You're such a puck face. Live. Not really. From Taylor's apartment, it's Puck Face Podcast, where hockey culture and counterculture collide. I'm Alaris, the producer and occasional interrupter. And now, the man who puts the clap in Dit Clapper, here's Taylor. We hail from Victoria, British Columbia, which just opened BC's very first meatless butcher shop. They use local organic vegetables instead of meat. I believe they use constructive criticism instead of knives. My roommate and favorite human is a vegan and just went there for a free burger night. Tickets were free and available to anyone. There were just only a hundred of them. So she's in line, and she overhears people saying some pretty judgmental stuff. The most interesting of which, to me, was someone who said, Oh my god, you can totally tell some of these people here aren't vegan. And I realized that veganism, like hockey, has a segment of the fan base that hates on casuals, that can't stand bandwagoners. And I react to that much in the same way that I react to how people treat casual hockey fans. If you are a vegan, don't you want non-vegans at that event so they have an entry point into veganism? Even if they are initially there for the free food, which by the way, there's nothing wrong with, you classist eggplant. Maybe a non-vegan at that event decides, wow, this is a great burger. I want to tell people about this place so that people outside of the target demographic become the target demographic. Maybe they decide, you know what? I had vegan food all wrong. Maybe I ought to explore this myself. If our little vegan friend would broaden their perspective and stop thinking in terms of gatekeeping, they'd realize having casuals at that event is something to embrace. So with that in mind, Let's talk about casual fandom in hockey. But first, the news! A Victoria woman is looking to sell an original edition of Spider-Man's first comic. Experts say it's likely the most expensive book in the city that's not in the university bookstore. Prince William and Duchess Kate are expecting a third child. Kensington Palace says the Duchess is suffering from severe morning sickness but is otherwise wealthy. (laughs) (laughs) Justin Trudeau has condemned North Korea's latest nuclear weapons test. The Canadian Prime Minister released a harshly worded statement in which he urged Kim Jong-un to quote, come on, or else Canada will be super frustrated. Nintendo's website has confirmed that Mario no longer works as a plumber. The beloved mascot was terminated from his position after allegedly taking mushrooms and setting fire to a client's pet turtle. And finally, police were able to catch a man accused of breaking into a home thanks to DNA evidence as the suspect went to the bathroom and failed to flush the toilet. Police are saying the man should probably hire two good lawyers, one for the burglary case and the other to sue Taco Bell. And that's the news. Alaris, what is your hockey origin story? Your hockey getting bit by a radioactive spider. Your hockey parents being gunned down outside a movie theater. And before you answer, let me just say that one of these movies, Batman's parents are going to make it through that scene. I just feel like they're due. That being said, give us the hockey origin story of Alaris. Well, um, <coughs> well, um, I hadn't really thought about this that much before. I, I used to think that it was just sort of through osmosis you know being around people who watched hockey um but having given it some thought I realized that it actually started for me when I was eight years old um in grade four um I was at this school for just a few months before we moved but the teacher the grade four teacher at the school was a huge fan of hockey um and he had this game where he assigned um you picked teams out of a hat all of the class members would pick teams out of a hat And then that would be our team for the season and then throughout the playoffs. Um, So I didn't get to play the whole game. But I remember the team that I picked was the Montreal Canadiens. And um, there was, I didn't know anything about hockey at this point. I had never seen a game. But there was this kid um, who got the San Jose Sharks. And he was trying to trade me the San Jose Sharks for the Montreal (laughs) Canadiens. And I... You know, I had no way of knowing, like, who was a better team. 
but I just had this feeling about the Habs, you know, and so he was trying to convince me that it was a good trade, and I was like, yeah. yeah. And this was like the San Jose Sharks were just coming off expansion, and they were terrible. Yeah. The Can- was, was, like, was that the Canadians' cup year? Um, this would be like, um, I think 92, like 91, 92. Okay, so like, yeah, just before. Yeah. All right. But, you know, I think what he was doing was legit. Like, who wouldn't, you know, try to trade the San Jose <laughs> Sharks for the Habs yeah. in 91, 92. But, um, yeah, I was just like, no, this is my team. Like, I just had this feeling about them. And um, ever since then, um, I've been a Habs fan. Like, it was kind of, you know, asleep for a while. Mm-hmm. And then when I did start watching hockey, you know, in my later teens, early 20s, I was surrounded by Canucks fans. But I just had this love the Habs right off the bat um and funny enough I've always had this thing against the San Jose <laughs> Sharks like that came along with me yeah um they they just irk me somehow and I do you hate beards as well do I hate beards yeah well because Brent Burns and Joe Thornton have the enormous beards hey oh no yeah. um <laughs> I I wish I could grow a beard I love beards and actually one of my uh, one of my dreams would be to be able to just grow a beard whenever I want. Mm-hmm. You um, could you could be a beard. Okay, moving right along. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I was a, a Habs fan in the the midst of um, you know pretty hardcore Canucks fans, and um, that's what actually made me stop watching hockey for a while. Like it took me a while to get back into hockey after the the Vancouver riots. Yeah. Um, that just, I didn't want to be a part of any fandom that would, that would do that. Yeah. Um, it just kind of like sickened me and I was just done with the whole thing. So I was no longer a hockey fan, mm-hmm. basically because of Canucks fans. Like, sorry, you guys, but yeah. that's how it went down. I would imagine there are, are many like yourself who felt the same way stopped watching for a while after that so, so yeah the, so the crucible of of your hockey fandom was this act of resistance in which you were exerting your right to exist as a casual fan which is yeah yeah kind of um <clears throat> sorry <laughs> oh, is this the, i know i was going is the segue i wrote too awkward <laughs> no <laughs> okay <laughs> no it's not too awkward all right it's me i'm too awkward oh, okay all right but uh, what about you, though? What's your hockey Uncle Ben getting shot by the burglar? Because, you know, that's actually the moment of crisis that created the hero Spider-Man. Alaris, by the way, works in a comic store, so. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, Taylor, I think that's what you're going for. That's fine. Yeah. But yeah, what's your hockey Cylons attacking? Your hockey Dana Scully being signed to the X-Files? Yes, my, my hockey Rachel Green leaving Barry at the altar. Uh, well, my earliest memory of a specific hockey game was Game 6 of the 91 Final, where the Pittsburgh Penguins beat the Minnesota North Stars 8 nothing to capture their first of five Stanley Cups. They would win the next year as well, and I watched that from a hospital bed. My asthma was severe as a child, and I was frequently hospitalized. And on this occasion, I had a TV in my room, thank goodness, and my nurse was a Chicago Blackhawks fan, and he asked me to page him whenever anyone scored so he could come and we would watch the replay. So mine is a, a story of, of, of hockey as hearth, uh, a safe cocoon in which fandom was bestowed upon me as a sort of birthright. When I was but a bun in the oven, my mom used to go to Kamloops Blazers games. They were really, really good at the time. Their goal horn was um, uh, Bachman Turner Overdrives taking care of business. So probably still get that stuck in my head sometimes. Um, but even as a kid, I, I chose teams that I liked based on their jerseys. I, I loved the Bruins and the Penguins black and yellow. I hated when the North Stars moved to Dallas and the Whalers moved to Raleigh, mostly because I loved how those teams looked. And I still kind of operate that way. And I would imagine others do often in the case of other leagues. Um, Like NCAA, love me some North Dakota jersey. And WHL, New York Riveters jersey. Come on, like I would root for for that team based on their jerseys a lot. The point being, it's okay to like something because of neat colors or because of an aesthetic. It's okay to have an entry point. Yeah, like, um, I started liking the Nashville Predators because I loved their bright yellow jerseys. Um, I just liked the way they looked, and so I started watching their games, mm-hmm. um, calling them my little dandelions. Yeah. 
and following them because I was looking at the bright, pretty colors turned into liking how they play and being a fan of them as a team. Yeah, exactly. So, you, you know, you start liking the colors and all of a sudden it's like, oh, Victor Arvidsson can really wheel. And, and you know, that turns into being invested in, in guys like Ryan Johansson and Kevin Fiala and, and seeing them on crutches in the cup final and that making you cheer for the Preds even harder. <laughs> Sniff, single tear. Yes, um, I was rooting for the Panthers. So, yay! <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I mentioned earlier how classism can be present among the more militant um, uh, sect of vegans. Ableism is another one. Just ask anyone on Twitter who talks about having gastroparesis. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about casual fandom as an opening through which society's isms enter hockey culture. It seems to me that with women often being assumed to be casual fan, that this is most predominantly a gendered thing. Would you agree? Well, I think it's predominantly a misogyny thing. But yeah, it's often been assumed by cis dudes that because I show an interest when hockey comes up as a topic of discussion, <clears throat> that yeah. I must be watching it at home with my boyfriend. Like, oh. ew. I mean, I am a casual fan, but what the hell is wrong with that? Like, hockey is supposed to be a form of entertainment for its spectators, not a job. And I don't have the energy to put in a bunch of work to prove I should be allowed to enjoy it. Like, it's an immensely entertaining sport. There's a lot to like, and there's lots of room for people to like it in different ways, okay? Yeah, I, I get the feeling that a lot of this hate of bandwagon fans is that, that thinly veiled misogyny where just saying I resent women being around me would be too obvious. Um, I see a dynamic that, that occurs in, in gaming as well as sports where men will have operate with a sort of angst and be asking, where are all the women gamers? Or <laughs> where are all the women hockey fans? And then yell at them as soon as one shows up. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and that's totally tied to what you were talking about um, with me the other day uh, regarding, like, fetishizing of casual fandom. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, we've all seen it, or speaking for myself, at least, I've seen it. The whole, like, geek girls are hot thing. Yeah. The thing about that, though, is try being a geek girl and accessing spaces related to your fandom without being interrogated right the fuck out of there. Yeah, there's a lot of, you know, like the Barstool Twitter account and their followers will, you know, they'll love to tweet stuff for like, you know, nothing like seeing your woman in your team's jersey. Like, oh. <laughs> um, there's there's a lot of um, inherent gaslighting that comes with knee-jerk anger at casual fans. It's another place where people like to tell, uh, tell people that their feelings and experiences aren't real, particularly if that person is a marginalized group. Um, I'm reminded... Of the whole, uh, the, the Jon Snow thing from the last episode of Game of Thrones um, that we watched where he possibly guarantees the destruction of humanity <laughs> by refusing to lie strategically, which Cersei then has no problem with. And everyone's like, what the fuck, dude? And he's just like, hey, no one feels as bad about this as I do. <laughs> yeah. well, no one feels <laughs> things as strongly as I do. Yeah. <laughs> the thing, anything that isn't a cishet white male experience is somehow less vivid and real. Yeah, and I think there there's a connection between all of this and um, this point that you were making about those roundtable discussions on hockey analysis shows, Yeah, where it's usually all men, but if a woman is there, her job is to facilitate the discussion rather than do any analyzing. Yeah. You know, like she's peripheral to what is at the core still thought to be a male experience. Yeah, it's sort of that uh, the Catherine Tappen role in ABC, and when you hear her on like a podcast... You know, when you hear on like Puck Soup or whatever talking about, you know, getting into the nitty gritty of, of plays or whatever, you're like, holy shit, she knows a lot. Yeah, she's um, just dropping a mic all over the place. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, there's there's um, an overriding anxiety in hockey culture around growing the game. We lament when we see signs that it hasn't grown enough. There was a, a video making its way around hockey Twitter that showed the SPN cameras picking, picking up Eric Carlson at the U.S. Open. And the announcers didn't recognize who he was or what sport he played, which is, to me, is funny. But yeah. they're like, that guy, isn't that guy famous? That famous. <laughs> what does he do, though? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, no, no sports fandom has an inferiority complex quite the way hockey fandom does. So we talk about growing the game, but we don't evaluate our own reactions enough when the game does grow. If you bristle at casuals, is it really growth that you want? It's like, hey, this sport is great. More people should like my sport. What? You only start watching in the playoffs? Fuck you. You're not a real fan. 
yeah, buddy, like, do you actually want the game to grow or do you just want everything to be exactly the way you want it to be all the time in every moment? Yeah. It's like how uh, Canadians, uh, of which we are too, want hockey to have more mainstream acceptance on a global level, but then we lose our shit when we don't win a tournament. Well, that's kind of a consequence of the game growing. When the Winnipeg Jets moved to Arizona, it was seen as this affront to Canadian hockey purity. I certainly saw it that way as a 12-year-old because I was taught to see it that way. Well, guess who only becomes a hockey fan because he saw a team in Arizona? Austin Matthews, kid with an American father and a Mexican mother who might be the one who brings the cup back to where it huge air quotes belongs. We heart Austin Matthews. Yes, we do. Austin Matthews. Um... I think some of the resentment of casual fandom is based on how the NHL has tried to grow the game, which in the case of, say, the glow puck is kind of fair. (laughs) Fox Sports was the owner of NHL broadcasting rights in the late 1990s, and they used Fox Tracks puck technology, spelled T-R-A-X because the 90s, which highlighted the puck on the screen so that it could be seen better. Now, there was an element of poo-pooing the league for essentially attempting to implement an accessibility tool, which again, casual fandom as a vector through which society's isms enter hockey culture. But it's not like the technology particularly made the puck easier to see. HD is what the doctor ordered there. I would argue puck tracks made the game harder to follow. Whenever someone shot the puck, a red beam would trail behind it. So God help you if it gets deflected. Or if you love seeing the mesh ripple, which is how you actually know the puck went in, It was hockey meets Tron, but at least the NHL was doing something innovative to become more accessible to new people. It was the wrong innovation, but hey, good, be wrong, mess up, as Miss Frizzle would say. Yeah. Uh, ESPN did a poll in 2002 where they uh, they asked readers to name the worst innovations in sports history. Uh, Pox Tracks came in sixth. It's hard to even say. Pox Pox (laughs) Tracks, yeah, exactly. Pox Tracks. I just have to take a drink of... My beer, because saying puck track so much. <laughs> that was very nearly a spit take. Oh, really? <laughs> Time to get a new microphone. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, also, the the whole thing with um, John Scott um, uh, at the All-Star Game a couple years ago, he's this enforcer, and, and the NHL did this uh, fan voting thing where the fans would pick a guy to go into the All-Star Game. And so Jeff Merrick and Greg Wyshynski on their podcast, decided to be shit disturbers, and they were like, well, let's get everyone to vote for John Scott. He was an enforcer who played for Arizona at the time, and everyone did. And so the NHL tried to make it not happen. So the NHL was, like, just wringing their hands this whole time, and they eventually did have John Scott at the All-Star Game, yeah. and the ratings just exploded. Everybody watched it. Everybody loved it. John hey. Scott scored two goals. He was the MVP. Brent Burns put him on his shoulders, which is amazing because John Scott is six foot eight. But again, it's like something that is an entry point for new fans, and the NHL is just like, no, no, yeah, no. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Anyhow, Anywho. just for fun, I did a search on Twitter of the phrase, not a true hockey fan, if. Just because I wanted to see what sort of sentiments people were expressing following that phrase. So here are some results. You're not a true fan if you don't think fighting belongs in hockey. So Olympic hockey isn't real hockey. Most playoff hockey isn't real hockey. I'm not strongly for or against fighting. Seeing 16-year-old kids feel like they kind of have to fight to get an NHL scouts or coaches' attention, that kind of bothers me. Yeah, yeah. At the same time, I'm not opposed on principle to the threat of violence as a deterrent toward worse violence, which fighting isn't always, but can be. And I'd be lying if I said there wasn't a part of me that enjoys seeing two consenting adults throw down. Bang. <laughs> Ted, Ted Cruz is still fresh in our minds. Um, oh, God. I don't, I don't love fighting, but it's on its way out of the game anyway. That being said, the idea that you have to like fighting to like hockey is just silly. Uh, also, you, you aren't, you are not, you're not a true fan if you can't name the Florida Panthers captain. That's just rude. <laughs> I could barely name him, and I have a Game Center subscription. Just deal with the irrelevance of your team, Florida fan. Honestly, I until you said that I'd forgotten that the Florida Panthers were a team. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. Wow. Um, yeah, I think most people in Florida don't know that the Florida Panthers were a team. Um, most people in Miami, anyway. 
you're not a true hockey fan if you're not watching the Leafs Oilers game right now. Some of us have things to do. You don't know how to pronounce Taves. I would love to see that guy try to pronounce Oleg Tverdovsky or Branko Radovojevic. Yeah, and like, I bet you don't know who's baby pooped in the Stanley Cup in 2008. Who's baby pooped in the Stanley Cup in 2008? Well, if you were a real fan, you would know that. <laughs> it was Chris Draper's baby pooped in the Stanley Cup. Yeah. Um, which, yeah, that's pretty hilarious. I, 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 um, I don't have anything interesting to say about yeah. that. Yeah, speaking so. of poo-pooing the league, <laughs> something you said earlier. Thank you for <laughs> saving me from that moment. <laughs> um, okay, that's awesome. Poop. Um, I'm not editing that out. <laughs> You're not a true hockey fan if you only watch once the playoffs roll around. Fuck you. Fuck you. You're only a true hockey fan if you don't hate Pierre Maguire. Now, I disagree with this as a person who hates most things. You like Pierre Maguire, though. I like Pierre Maguire. I know that people find him really annoying, but I actually find that kind of endearing about him. Um, And I just remember this beautiful moment. I wish I could remember when it was or what game it was. This was years ago. But um, he was doing color commentary uh, for Gord Miller. And then there just happened to be this, like, moment of silence. And then you just hear Pierre going, Gord? And Gord is like, <laughs> Gord is like, yes. <laughs> and he was just, like, the whole time just being so, like, deferential to Gord Miller. And then it's like, Gord? And so, yeah, me and my, my ex at the time, because, yes, guess what? I was watching hockey <laughs> with a partner dun, at home. Dun, dun. Right. But, um... Yeah, we just had this running joke of Pierre Maguire being like, hey, Gord, Gord, it's me, Pierre. That was a really good Gord, Gord Miller. Gord, am I doing uh, a good job? Yeah. That was a great Gord Miller, by the way. <laughs> Thank yes. you. But yeah, Pierre Maguire, it's it's just kind of adorable. Anyway. Uh, can I tell a, a, another great announcer story? Please um, do. Because, um, you know, we, we, this can be as long as it is. Um <laughs> Um, so it was a Canucks and Nashville game in the mid two thousands, and um, it was John Shorthouse and John Garrett commentating for uh, Sportsnet. And so John Garrett has this this quirk about him where he he brings up food at every opportunity. <laughs> and um, so there was this uh, there was this ad for um, oh god it was it was like a I don't know it was like a it was like a restaurant or something it might have been McDonald's or Arby's. And um, it was something that sold that sold cheeseburgers. And um, John Garrett, after Shorthouse did the spiel, attempted to say, "I'm a burger aficionado," but he couldn't find the word aficionado, so he just said, "I'm a burger," and it just hung there for about three or four seconds. And then John Shorthouse is like, "You're a burger." I love that story. <laughs> Which is the greatest moment in broadcasting history. <sighs> it's a good one. It is. Good old Cheech. Um, <laughs> he's called Cheech because he has a mustache that looks like Cheech Marin. Um, oh. You're not a true hockey fan if you're not on your feet when your team is on a penalty kill. Oh, so much ableism. Mm-hmm. No. <sighs> That makes me really upset. Yeah. Yeah. You know that people, just not everyone can just, like, be on their feet, right? Yeah. But you're not a true hockey fan unless you can. Yeah. Fuck you. Yeah, it's like, oh, God, there was a, I think, oh, was it a Kanye West concert? Was it Kanye West who was, like, yelling at a fan who wasn't standing up when everyone else was standing up? I don't. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Google that later. Okay. And if it wasn't Kanye West... I think you're a little bit more in tune with popular culture. Yeah, if it wasn't Kanye West, this is getting edited out. If it was, it's not. <laughs> yeah, being around neurotypical men, for me as a hockey fan, is very challenging because of attitudes like this. Um, uh, the idea of a, of a true fan being, you know, besides a, a basic logical fallacy, um, is just a thinly veiled excuse to gatekeep. There's mm-hmm. no such thing as a true fan. It's also a distancing tactic, this was at its most insufferable after the 2011 Cup riots, where Canucks fans were like, well, the people who rioted, were, rioted weren't real fans, which is uh. such crap. Like some anarchist who doesn't even watch hockey is going to choose a Christian Erhoff jersey to riot in. Please. It's now time for a regular segment on Puckface Podcast. 
It's called What's Not Upsetting Taylor About the Vancouver Canucks. I'm not, I'm not upset, upset now, I got, got no regrets now. now, I don't care about the Vancouver Canucks. So give, give me those Vancouver Canucks. Singing. It's a wonderful day for an exorcism. On our first edition of What's Not Upsetting Me about the Vancouver Canucks, we discussed the launch of Sportsnet's all-new Vancouver-based sports talk radio station. Primarily, we talked about the inexplicable choices of Evening News sports reporter Myra Lawrence and former Global News anchor and BC Liberal candidate Steve Darling as hosts of the early morning show. And James Sabolski, who I still maintain looks good in a vest. And on September the 4th, Sportsnet 650 debuted. Holiday Monday is an interesting choice to launch a radio station, but whatever. Many interesting choices. Yeah, there, yeah, yeah. We'll start with the good. Sportsnet 650's lineup after the early morning show is not bad at all. I listened to the playbook with Sadiar Shah and John Jang. It's on from 9 to 12, after which Shah takes over for the Canucks at noon spot. They are awesome! Right away, they get into how two-year deals are kind of the new one-year deal in that they're just as easy to bury somewhere, which is a take I hadn't heard framed quite that way before. They talked about specifically defining competitive. Like when Jim Benning talks about how he wants the Canucks to be competitive, that doesn't mean make the playoffs or contend for a cup. All it means is not getting shelled 7 nothing every night. A 28th place team that loses a bunch of one-goal games is by management's definition competitive because that's easier to sell than 28th place team. That was subversive for a station with the broadcasting rights. So it's nice to see mediocrity not be rewarded as of 8.59 a.m. Also, the Sportsnet app was crapping out all day. Hopefully Rogers gets their shit together. I listened to a bit of the Perry Salkowski and Randeep Janda show from uh, 1 to 4, and it was fine. I've always found Salkowski a little on the bland side. He's not offensive. He's just there. Uh, the chemistry isn't where Shaw and Jangs is, but hopefully that'll improve. On day three, they had a great interview with Jeff Merrick, where Randeep Janda pointed out how the Declaration of Principles that the NHL is taking part in, which we might get to in a later episode, doesn't address the cost of hockey, which is something that we talked about here on episode one. So that was promising. By the time it got to Rintel's show, I'd given up on the app, but I'm sure he's fine. Scott Rintel, you're lovely. As for the early morning show, Myra Lawrence sounded nervous. She was rushing. She was out of breath. And most frustratingly, she was essentially relegated to reading last night's scores and news items, which everyone consumes on social media now anyway. She did not speak one time during Corey Hirsch's 15-minute hit. She did not speak once during Travis Lule's interview. She did not speak once during Whitecaps manager Bob Leonard Doozy's interview. This would be less shitty had you marketed her as the newsreader, producer sort of sidekick role. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> but they marketed her as a co-host. At one point, she went a full 23 minutes without saying a word. If you're going to advertise having a woman host... Maybe she should, I don't know, host. So it's basically the Sabalski and Darling show, which, ugh, the banter has not gotten less forced since the breakfast television thing. Uh, I think it comes a lot more naturally to Sabalski than it does to the other two. They had this one back-to-school conversation prior to Jim Benning coming on that was basically like a repetition of cliches that you say to a neighbor when you run into each other and you mutually don't want to stop and chat, but you also don't care enough to avoid the stop and chat. Just like the back in the old routine, huh? Great to get rid of those kidlets. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Quality banter on a sports talk radio station is important because it's supposed to be a refuge from the stale and platitudinous small talk you have with customers and coworkers all day. It's why chemistry between hosts is so crucial. There is none of it here. That's not something Steve Darling can get away with on a sports show like he did on a stuffy news program. At one point, Sabolski brought up Will and Kate, who are having another baby, and Steve Darling very not ironically responds, Everyone loves Will and Kate. <laughs> yes. I, too, am in the coveted millennial slash monarchist demographic. I pray to the Queen every day. I found the Queen when I was 17. I just felt something was you know, missing in my life. And that, you know, there's got to be something out there that's, like, bigger than myself. Then there she was. General Motors Place, October 6, 2002. 
the ceremonial face-off. She walked slowly down the red carpet. Not a girl, not yet an octogenarian. She stood beside Wayne Gretzky. She held that cold rubber disc in her hand, a national symbol standing beside a national symbol, about to drop a national symbol on a national symbol so our national symbol could be played by two teams of 20 national symbols. When that puck hit the ice, I knew I was a modern. Anyway, banter. Uh, Michael Landsberg and Brian Hayes are outstanding at banter. The banter on Overdrive is at times Seinfeldian. Andy Petrillo does great banter when Gord Miller is on with Andy. Fucking magic. The Jim Benning interview was fine. Jim (laughs) Benning. I wasn't expecting that. Um, (laughs) It was... It was fun to hear Jim Benning say that their policy isn't to bring contract negotiations into the media, considering he's been fined by the league for bringing trade negotiations into the media. <laughs> to, to his credit, Steve Darling sounds like he does his work. He's, he made some good points on Thomas Vanek and, and about fans accepting a rebuild. He said that Brock Besser has earned Vanek's spot, which is weird considering they do both shoot right, but they play different sides of the ice. Maybe he meant the power play specifically. Although even then you would put Vanek in the center between the hash marks. And I think Besser would be more to the right side in the circle. Um, There was a rare moment of Myra Lawrence actually saying something about Nat Bailey stadium and Steve Darling kind of jumped on her and transitioned right to the Travis Lule interview. He just, he has a dismissive way of talking, which we heard in the breakfast television interview. Yeah, um, actually, uh, he has a dismissive way of being that, <laughs> that I saw in the breakfast television interview. Um, there were so many moments where, and particularly when Myra Lawrence was talking, um, you know, there were a few times where you could tell she was about to say something, but she was like waiting for the right moment to jump in. Um, as soon as Steve Darling had something to say, he would just like make this tiny motion and she would stop. She would see it and stop and he would say what he was going to say. And that's like when he had enough courtesy to do that instead of just like, you know, jumping all over it. But um, it felt like, you know, when you're watching like a TV TV show or a movie where there's this king in it and they have their, you know, their henchmen or whatever you call henchmen for royalty. (laughs) Um, But he just makes this tiny little gesture with his hand, and that, like, you know, causes um, people to, like, jump to attention. You know, he can, like, lift his finger, and somebody gets their head chopped off. Yeah. Um, But that's what it looked like. Like, Steve Darling was one of these, like, kings who could just, like, wave his hand a tiny bit, and then, like, everything was all about him. Yeah, that little gesture thing is like as common on oh. Game of Thrones as like as as like transitions that start with a scream. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, fuck Steve, darling. Yeah. Carry on. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I didn't gesture there. I promise. If anyone is listening, <laughs> spit take, spit take, spit take. Yay! Almost. Uh, okay. <laughs> we'll get we'll get one yet. All right. Um, uh, Sabalski is comfortable. He sounds like a seasoned professional. The show wasn't god-awful. It's just stiff and unapproachable. And then on day two, they gave Don Cherry a platform to diss Colin Kaepernick. Okay, sorry. I just, I don't even want to be around to listen to talk about Don Cherry. I'm going to go pee. Oh, okay. All right. Lyris is going pee. Bye, guys. Uh, all right. Well, it's just you and me, listeners. So, um... On day two, they gave a, a platform to Don Cherry to talk about Colin Kaepernick, because what we really need on Vancouver radio is more racist hotel wallpaper. So, of course, he uses the opportunity, when asked about him, to rant about how police do something bad, and it's on the front page, but they do something good, and it's on the back page, which is just a feeling he has. The media paint police as competent the vast majority of the time, And if occasionally they report on misconduct, that's kind of their fucking job. For God's sake, CBC gives Rex Murphy a platform to declare anti-fascists a terrorist group. Your idea that the right is being no-platformed in Canada is bullshit. White liberal hockey Twitter is more or less comfortable acknowledging Don Cherry's xenophobia every Saturday, but when he specifically capes for police... There are suddenly way fewer voices calling him out. 
Is it because we don't think his ide ideology is really that harmful? Is it because we're distanced from what Don Cherry is reacting to when he says the things that he says? We're fine spilling tea about stuff we all agreed was bad in 1990, stuff like negative rhetoric around European players. But his pro-cop rhetoric vis-a-vis -vis Colin Kaepernick is 2017 bad. Here's what Don Cherry wrote about Colin Kaepernick in September of last year. It's funny how athletes, when they know they're finished, they all of a sudden take a stand. Ah, yes, that epidemic of finished athletes taking a stand that I just decided is a thing. Which is fun, considering the 37 years that followed Don Cherry being finished <laughs> coaching. <laughs> For instance, the 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick. He knows he's not going to beat up the 49ers quarterback Gabbert. You see how I know the guy's name? It's Gabbert. So all of a sudden, he takes a stand on the Star Spangled Banner and not stand up to honor the flag. Let's just conveniently leave out the context of Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, Philando Castle, Trayvon Martin, Alton Sterling, Laquan McDonald, Mike Brown, Eric Garner, and so on and so on and so on. 258 black Americans were murdered by police in 2015 alone. That is a rate of five times higher for young black men than young white men. By the way, when you aren't going to beat out the starting quarterback, that makes you a what? A backup. Which makes you not what? Finished. There is no way Colin Kaepernick isn't as good as 60 guys currently signed in the NFL, according to a multitude of experts. There are a lot of teams whose quarterbacks are terrible. But that's beside the point. Because whether Colin Kaepernick should be in the NFL is at least somewhat debatable. What he's actually talking about isn't. But white people love to make the conversation about Kaepernick's employability because then they're not focusing on his words. And believe it or not, some people compare him to Muhammad Ali. So very wrong. Muhammad is misspelled, by the way. If you remember, Ali took a stand in the prime of his career and lost three good years. Okay, again, just because you have a feeling that people are comparing Colin Kaepernick to Muhammad Ali doesn't mean they actually are. If Colin Kaepernick really wanted to make a statement, he should have done it during the Super Bowl. Right. No way you would have called him attention-seeking. No way you would have found a reason why that's bad. No way you would have moved the goalposts on him. And make no mistake, he has made things tougher for the organization that has made him millions. Oh. I'm sorry, is Colin Kaepernick a marginal nobody or a big success in spite of himself? I'm confused at this point. The San Francisco 49ers made a profit of over $150 million per year, pretty much every year. I think they're going to be okay. Besides, if he feels so strongly about these issues, why does he not take the money he's going to, I was going to say earn, but I will say get, and give it to his causes? So delegitimizing black wealth, we're ticking off a lot of boxes here. Ugh. Also... Kaepernick donated a million dollars in all proceeds from his 2016 jersey sales that I know of, but thank you for your statement that reads like something the Polk County police chief wrote on his Stormfront account. Don Cherry would later call Kaepernick's donations, quote, a step in the right direction. Okay, buddy. Funny you didn't mention any of that during your Sportsnet 650 hit. Cherry likes to do this same sort of thing with P.K. Subban. No! Yeah, he'll pick out an instance of P.K. being properly deferential to suggest behavioral improvement. It's fucking gross. Oh my gross. god. Sorry, I came back way too soon. Yeah, you did. Um, <sighs> okay. You want to go pee on. again? Yeah, I kind of. <laughs> yeah, go pee. Go for it. Um, no, it's all right. All right. Um, yeah, and it's, it's not like he does the same thing. Anyway, behind the branding and the pomposity and the dressing up like your grandma's couch... Don Cherry is a far less uninformed person than we give him credit for. He reads newspapers every day. He knows what he is referring to when he chooses to insert his pro-police apologetics. When Don Cherry bloviates on Coach's Corner about how much hate police get, that's not a nebulous statement. He's commenting on real-life police shootings. Sorry, officer-involved shootings. Here's a me-involved middle finger. 
There was one week where he went on a particularly pointed rant on Coach's Corner about how little respect police get. That was days after a disabled black man was murdered by police in Ottawa. Abdirahim Abdi was his name. Cherry saw people rightfully outraged by that and said, oh yeah, well I'm going to stick it to him on my seven-minute platform that's supposed to be hockey analysis. I know we've become desensitized to that here, but can we just acknowledge that that's weird? But, you know, keep politics and hockey separate. Sure. There is no bigger offender in terms of imposing your politics onto sports than hockey culture's loudest social justice warrior. Don Cherry has been taking a knee at the end of a fucking hockey segment for 37 years. I don't know what's more insulting, everything I've already talked about, or the fact that Don Cherry acts as though the political right in this country has a monopoly on being properly sad when a cop or soldier dies. That's maybe one of the more sinister aspects of white privilege, getting to act like you own heartbreak. We agree. Where we live, a dangerous driver killed a cop who had two kids under six, Constable Sarah Beckett. You probably heard her name. She was mentioned on Coach's Corner. Don Cherry thinks that because you have concerns about a provably toxic culture within law enforcement, you find it less horrible that those kids lost their mom. Because you think there's something systemic going on when Saskatchewan police use the image of a First Nations woman for target practice, or when disabled people are killed by police at a significantly higher rate than abled people, somehow that means you don't feel enough when a cop or a soldier's kid has to grow up without a parent, according to Don Cherry. How dare you frame the left that way, you overdressed Fabergé egg. You don't own loss. And by the way, Charlena Lyle's kids lost their mom too. And rather than bring that up, Don Cherry wants to use his voice to stop black athletes from bringing it up. He has been telling young impressionable minds that a cop can do no wrong every Saturday for longer than I have been alive. So I call bullshit on this idea that Don Cherry is harmless. And that's what's not upsetting Taylor about the... Puppies, kittens, baby giraffes. Alaris, what else is nice and cute? Um, a uh, goofy little poppy with floppy ears and paws. That'll do. All right, let's just take a breath. Maybe have a drink of water. Be sure you're not tensing your tongue root. The tongue root, by the way, is the primary place of emotional withholding. It's the part of your body you are tensing way more often than you think you are. The things you learn in theater school. Okay, now that I've, in the parlance of BuzzFeed, totally destroyed Don Cherry, let's end this thing on a high note. Alaris, why don't we do a little bit of role-playing? Oh, right now? Yeah. Oh, was, oh right. You mean for the uh, for the podcast? Yes. Um, right, oh, okay. so <laughs> it's now time to introduce what will be a running segment on Puckface Podcast. In the spirit of Ice-T's Dungeons & Dragons audiobook, this is D and D League, Hockey D and D League. In lieu of four six-sided die, or d6s in RPG talk, um, because I forgot to bring them, we're using an app to roll up a quick character. We'll roll all the dice six times to determine scores for strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma, combining the three highest dice from each roll to get that score. And based on these stats, Taylor's going to decide which hockey player or personality is represented by that character. So if we can't think of somebody right away, we will pause and scour hockey reference. So without further uh, ago, because that's what I <laughs> apparently wrote, um, without further ado... Much ago about nogging. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, okay, roll that dice. Or hit that button on that Hit the app. button on the app. Okay, so for strength, we have... 16. Ooh, 16 thing, all right. Loser. All right, four... So- yeah, we got uh, two fives, a six, and a two. So we're removing the two because that's the lowest one. We're taking the top three. Mazel tov. All right. <laughs> for, for dexterity, we have... Oh. Ah, there's an ad. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Quick, turn off your Wi-Fi. I did not pay for this app. Um, all right. Okay. I said, all right, we're good. All right, so that would be... Um, Blur nine. Nine dexterity, sixteen strength. All right. For constitution we have. Ooh. Eighteen. Whoa! Yeah. Alright, so this is this is somebody who never gets injured. All right. For intelligence we have. Let's see, we got uh five, three, and two, ten. Alright. And intelligence. For wisdom we have. Uh oh. Wah, wah. Eight. Eight. This is looking pretty Shea Webbery. <laughs> All right. For charisma, we have. All right. Let's see. Final one. Nine. This is Shea Weber. <laughs> this is absolutely Shea Weber. We do not need to pause. 16 strength, nine dexterity, which isn't terrible. You know, Shea Weber can like chip the puck out off the boards. He's not gonna he's not gonna break the puck out in yeah, the same like, way that you know PK Subban does. Yeah, fifty percent of a full score. Exactly. Uh constitution we have eighteen. Shea Weber is a durable player. Um intelligence we have ten, which I get that's average. A wisdom we have eight, that's average. So, you know, he's a he's a person who 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 knows how to make a decent play, knows when to make a decent play, ultimately pretty safe. A player at this point in his career is a skill start to wane. And for charisma, we have a nine. So somebody who doesn't have the most interesting interviews, but isn't so surly with the the, the broadcasting uh, at intermission uh, interview types. Yeah, so, he'll tell you that they gave 110% and, you know, just kept taking the, the puck to the net. Exactly. Creating chances. Clichés <laughs> abound. So this is Shea Weber. And that was Hockey Dungeons and Dragons. Which other players will be drafted to accompany Shea Weber on their quest? Tune in next time. But before we go, here is Alaris with an important commentary. Well, folks. <clears throat> Fuck Don Cherry. And that's all the time we have for today. Follow us on at PuckFacePod on Twitter. Find our fully captioned episodes on the Puckface Pod YouTube channel. Download us on iTunes or wherever free podcasts are sold. Or if that's not your style and we're two worlds apart, listen to us on SoundCloud so we can reach to your heart. Now get out of here, you Puckface. <laughs>